Hello, everyone. I would like to welcome you to the seventh season of Artwork, a series in which uh, innovative artists come to Lang College to talk about the creative process. I'm Bonnie Maranka on the uh, theater faculty at Lang College and the curator of the series. Tonight, our guest is the writer, director, designer, John Jesserin, who for more than three decades has created a body of work that includes film, video, and computer-based pieces, as well as new plays and rewritings of classics such as Faust and Philoctetes. <clears throat> Many of you in the audience recently saw an episode of his Chang in a Void Moon at St. Mark's Church. John started this living film serial in 1982 in the Pyramid Club in the East Village. We saw episode 61. That's how long they've been going on. His web-based series entitled Shadowland, now on Vimeo, offers another cast of international characters in their own intrigues. In a recent interview, Jesserin offers some explanation of his approach to language. Here's what he told American Theatre Magazine. I come from a bilingual family, Spanish-English, and early on I learned that language had the potential to be very fluid. For me, this generated an endless interest in the mysterious origins of constructions, meanings, and incongruous forms inside people's heads. The idea that thoughts could so travel simultaneously in parallel but not symmetrical paths inspired a lot of possibilities. The Chang series is a good example of Jesserin's unique style of mixing song lyrics, world events, American culture, and a kind of deracinated poetry in a media-based work taking place in multiple planes of reality. In fact, a Village Voice critic once wrote, Jesserin's postmodern theater is set everywhere and nowhere. It matches the dislocated condition of our world in which disaster can happen anywhere and our TV news hounds will bring it to us. Jesserin's work reflects the crossovers between theater, visual arts, design, and literature. That is a contemporary way of working. It is anti-disciplinary in the true and best sense of the word. He, here is a good, he is a good example of the unconventional artist who can work alone or in collaborative settings. <clears throat> in areas of design, art, technology, media, and performance. Such a field of, of artistic activity has raised many issues with regard to the nature of presence and mediation of the human body. His early interest in identity, presence, and communication have been extended over the years to the digital age. Jesserin's theater is a rare example of a playwright writing plays for new media productions <clears throat> rather than tying together an authorless collection of text fragments. His stopped Bridge of Dreams, produced recently at La Mama, demonstrated his range of thinking in a theater work based on 17th century Japanese stories involving issues of live and mediated presence satellite photography, and inventive narrative modes in both text and video. His earlier play, Firefall, offered a theater work for actors, live camera, and internet, with actors constantly calling up pages from searches online during the performance. A few years ago, he first staged it here at Lang College with students. But if search is the operative word, surely it exists both in the existential and in the digital sense. Here, the uploading of layer upon layer of pages of text and image led not to an epistemological site or to personal discovery, but to an unending web stream exceeded only by its contentlessness. The accumulation of information was not a form of knowledge production. Jesserin is one of the theater artists most engaged in critiquing the impact of new technologies on the spiritual, political, and cultural life of individuals in a global setting. John Jesserin is constantly working, <laughs> demonstrating the effort of sheer human labor required outside the margins of established theater. For his efforts, he has been honored with many awards including a Guggenheim, Obie, and a MacArthur Fellowship. His work has been seen in Europe, South America, and Japan, 
And in New York at La Mama, the Kitchen Dance Theater Workshop, Brooklyn Academy of Music, and Asia Society, to name only a few places. Tonight he is here with us to speak about his work in all senses of the word. Please join me in welcoming him. Um, thank you, thank you for coming. So I'm, I'm gonna try to give you like a, a survey uh, from the beginning to the present, just so you get an idea of uh, where all these things might have come from and how they uh, have converged together over the years. And um, so it's always interesting for me to go, to go back uh, pretty much to the beginning and see um, uh, really the, the, the early, early part. So I'll, I'll just say that I, I never went to theater school, did not study uh, playwriting or any of those things. Uh, I went to art school. I went uh, to study painting originally, and then I very quickly switched into sculpture. And then by the time I went to graduate school, I had, uh, was already switching into film and video. So um, I, I just described it as sort of a search for different kinds of um, uh, media and, and levels of understanding space and ideas. So I, I went really from two-dimensional into three-dimensional and then kind of back into two-dimensional again. And, um, and then through film and video and television was able to uh, expand into other ideas. Um, so that's, that's my background really is, is uh, art. Um, and uh, I, I, I'm very interested uh, obviously in I'd say more modern art, but um, I do have this art background that goes all the way back to the classical and, and uh, forward from there. So, uh, from being an art student, then I moved to New York City, and um, I ended up with some jobs in television. So just briefly, just to tell you how all this gets layered up and then ends up in some of these crazy pieces that I do. Um, so this was back in the mid, mid 70s. Um, and so I worked for uh, three years for CBS doing a, um, a social research study. They had a social research department there. I don't know if they have one now, but um, so it was a floor of professors, academics, all worried about the effects of mass communication. So uh, I was part of this study, so we would watch four hours of television a day and um, collect information on it. And that's when I really started to realize um, that uh, you know media was, uh, even back in the 70s, something um, potentially amazing and sort of monstrous, I guess. So, um, so that, I worked there for three years. And then from there, I went to the DeCavett Show, which was on PBS at the time. And he um, is an amazing interviewer, and at that time was obviously much more well known. But he pioneered the the one-on-one, -on -one, um, very serious interview with all kinds of uh, some show business people, but a lot of intellectuals, writers, filmmakers, all kinds of people went through there. So that really was a huge education, three years working for him as the assistant to his producer and uh, working on actually uh, a television show which had to be shot um, a few days a week. So there would be several episodes of, of um, these guests coming in and out and everything had to be prepared, and then it would be shot in a studio. So that uh, really got me into this, um, the thought of uh, information being processed and transferred and mediated. Um, and also, uh, let's say the first mediator I realized was actually um, the human being or our own body is sort of mediating the inside to the outside. So that's still kind of a, a big, uh, question for me. Um, how does the inside get to the outside? And um, also the outside to the inside. But uh, so this whole idea of mediation became very um, interesting to me as I watched uh, those interviews being made live. And um, the other thing about Cavett was that he, was, he really liked to shoot from beginning to end with no stopping, no cuts. That was generally how it was done. So um, 
uh, which in a way was a, a kind of theater in a way that had to be managed live, even though it was being recorded. So uh, it had to be managed for the camera and then sent out to a, a large audience. Uh, so that, all these things kind of uh, merged and I was making um, short, uh, I guess, art films is what we would call them today. Um, and then uh, the, the, I, I always say that, you know, Reagan was elected and the Cabot show was canceled. So um, <laughs> uh, PBS didn't even want it anymore. So uh, it, it was an interesting, all that is to me also a cultural type of education that I, um, was lucky enough to sort of to be involved in um, because so many different kinds of, especially writers went through there. And I think that's where I also started thinking about um, the importance of, of the written word. And uh, because more, before that I was much more visual. And so here I was dunked into um, a world of uh, a lot of kinds of a literature, basically. It was a very literary type of a show. Um, so that's really where I started thinking more about that. And all these things uh, eventually kind of came together bit by bit. And at that time, after, after that show was canceled, um, the other thing is that working for television, you're on a weekly uh, schedule. So I was still thinking like that. And um, the Pyramid Club had just pretty much opened in the East Village in uh, 82. and. Um, I just thought, well, let's, let's do um, a weekly show and uh, I'll just write it a new episode every week, kind of like they do on television. So um, I, they, they let me do it. They said, well, fine, if you can do it, then, then we'll be happy. So th but this was also a club, and I'm just also saying all this because um, uh, of the cultural, I'm just trying to maybe fit myself in a little bit for you into where the cultural the trends and, and uh, the way people were living then, and me as part of the culture, part of the culture and the, part of the, the people that create the culture. So I believe everybody is responsible for the culture all together, and that's what, what um, we're making every day. So um, this was the East Village, um, uh, a c kind of a crazy club mi mixture. It was kind of, in a weird way, um, it was kind of like a gay rock club, which did not exist then. But um, there were a lot, of, a lot of rock and roll bands. There were drag queens. There were all kinds of people were in there. And um, it was a completely free type of atmosphere that would um, allow something like this to happen, whereas other places um, uh, would not allow this to happen. Um, anyway, so this, here, this is the Pyramid Club. Uh, this is Chang to Void Moon. So we did that 82 to 83, and we were there for a year, and um, I was basically doing uh, an episode every week, um, and I think we did uh, 36 episodes in a row without stopping, and then the rest of the year we did uh, what I was calling reruns, which was we would revisit old episodes and redo them again. So uh, just to show you where, you know, how things are, you see that uh, Frank Mai here is standing on a cinder block, and um, this is a tiny, tiny stage. And this is kind of a great uh, uh, picture to show you what a, a night at the pyramid might be and who these people are. So the, there's Frank Maya. Um, there is uh, Steve Buscemi. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, there's John Kelly. Um, there's Mark Boone Jr. over there, um, Sons of Anarchy. Uh, in the back is Fiona Templeton. Um, uh, avant-garde uh, uh, playwright and director. Frank Maya, you know, became a you know, very famous uh, gay comedian um, and also was a, a singer. So all these kind of people would uh, mix together every, every week and, and yeah, every night at the Pyramid Club. So um, uh, this is kind of a typical way I would organize the stage since I didn't, I didn't really have any uh, training in it. I wanted to make it all cinematic because I loved uh, film and video and television. So it all had to go that way. So some scenes were very short, some, some were very long. Some, uh, let me just get moving here. Um, some were, uh, over here you see there's a, a television set. And um, 
it was really the first episode of Chang that I used a television set, and then I used one really in every episode in one way or another. But uh, the actress couldn't remember the line, so I said, well, I'll just videotape you, and then somebody can talk to the television set. And that's how we, it was just a practical way to get around a problem. And then it brought up all these ideas about uh, what is an actor, uh, who is alive, all these kind of questions, which I'll just say now that still um, go through my work. Uh, I realized as we were doing um, Chang again, you know, so much later, all the kind of the same <laughs> questions <laughs> come up again um, in different ways and said by different people. So things like um, people are always asking, uh, who are you? Uh, where am I? Um, what am I? What are, all these kind of questions about uh, location and identity um, and uh, why are you here? What are you doing here? Uh, all, all these kinds of uh, almost like childlike questions that kind of define um, our identity. The kind of go somebody people keep saying, you know, am I dead uh, or am I alive? <laughs> I don't know. Um, so. Uh, all these kind of questions get peppered through um, uh, these, these works, and it really kind of started um, in Chang. So this is just another, another uh, then I also, there was such a little space, I just had to cram everything together. So these are, are just um, conversations that would be ha had in very, uh, I guess, strange, uh, apparently strange locations, but they worked, they were very, very economical. And they seem to work very um, logically, uh, also for the for the audience. Um, seem to understand how things were fitting together, even though they didn't look like it was a it wasn't a naturalistic um, setup. Um, and then I was also interested, in, uh, like I said before, in in cinema and the camera, the whole idea of the camera, the camera looking, the camera could be anywhere, a human. Uh, couldn't be. So I started uh, changing the stage to um, accommodate this. And so these, these people are basically on their sides. And it looks like the audience, the light would come on, the audience would uh, think they were seeing it from above, and then they would realize that they weren't. So, um, you know, just for a flash, uh, the question comes up, you know, where am I, you know, uh, or, or where are these people? Um, why are they doing that? What's the matter with them? All those kinds of questions. Um, <laughs> so uh, here's another one. Um, this is uh, the woman who apparently is laying down is actually standing up. And the woman at the bottom is actually laying down, and she's apparently standing up. So they would have these conversations in these um, kind of unorthodox positions, uh, physical positions, um, which uh, it had an effect on the acting. It also made me think about uh, what acting was, what uh, the presence of an actor on the stage was. Um, why, why was it, uh, why were we only have to have everybody always on one plane in uh, theater, in performance? So people ended up hanging from, from rafters and doing all kinds of things while they were speaking a very, very difficult text. So that was another thing is I, was very influenced by, let's say, people like Hitchcock and um, Ingmar Bergman. And I was interested in a lot of these kind of thorny type of texts. Uh, also, I was also uh, happy to inject humor, but um, also uh, happy to mix all these things together, as well as another thing that came out very, very soon, which also goes through my work, is that um, the emphasis really can be on a kind of a plot or a story, but actually the, the real plot or the story that's reflected in the setup and um, the staging and the use of the cameras is really kind of a reflection of what is happening to the actor as a human being on, on the stage. There's kind of a focus on uh, the audience will say, oh, well, you know, I'm listening to this conversation. However, the actor seems to be hanging upside down. How is he doing that? So it's something that uh, uh, I like to use to distract the person from um, imagining all the time that this person is actually a character. Uh, there's this whole question on who is a character, who is not a character. 
um, or are they just people up there standing uh, up there and talking? Um, so all these questions actually started coming out very early in Chang and then um, uh, started getting developed. Okay, so this is uh, just another example of this uh, talking uh, between a live person and a television set. And eventually it became much more complicated. Here's another uh, view from the top. Uh, so um, all these people would actually be leaning over this this board, really, and then um, uh, in the midst of a very long, uh, difficult kind of conversation that they were, they had memorized of mine. Um, so uh, anyway, but the this television the use of television sets, and obviously now more screens, but um, became much more complicated, and I ended up using uh, four or five different television sets talking to each other. Uh, at some point later on, we'll see it's just screens talking to each other, no, no live people. So all kinds of variations of um, the use of a, the human, either a human face or images and voice um, connected either to, uh, image to image or image uh, to human being. Um, Actually, I'm going to also say if people have questions about things, they could uh, ask me if they want to, because um, I'm just kind of speeding along here. We have a long way to go. <laughs> we have 30 more years to get through. <laughs> oh, God. So um, uh, let, um, uh, I'm, just, I'm just going to go through these uh, <coughs> relatively quickly. This is just one, just to show you, uh, is two film projectors facing each other. And um, the actors, the live actors in the middle, um, five or six actors are, are pre-edited um, to the live actors. Um, uh, they're pre-edited on these two screens that actually run simultaneously and are not exactly the same, but are all edited together. So we have Screen A, screen B, and then the actors. Uh, and the play, uh, the way I was working, and, and still work in a lot of ways, is that that's how I write it. I, I'm not really writing it um, specifically for character A, B, C, D, E. Um, I'm writing it uh, character one on screen A, character three on screen B. Uh, it all gets um, made that way. So it's not really written for, particularly for a stage. It's written for this intermedia type of um, connection that I'm trying to make. Um, so it, in that sense, it's very influenced actually by the media and by uh, uh, how media works. That also influences my, my writing. Um, and this is just... Um, a picture of uh, this particular piece. And it had two, two live projectors. And they, they started, they were um, running simultaneously, synced up together. And then when they ran out at the end, um, that was the end of the piece. And the audience could see the projectors running in these glass boxes, um, which also created, uh, like I said before, a great sense of tension um, for not only for the actors on the stage, but for the audience was kind of worried about the actors being able to get through this. And um, there's kind of concern about how, actually how are they doing this? How are they managing this as a, a person standing in, up there and walking around? So that also reflected the actual, let's say, plot of the story as well, um, which really in this particular piece called Deep Sleep was really about um, this kind of preposterous, kind of almost childish idea of who is more real, the um, screen or the live actor. It, things, my designs started getting much more, let's say, architectural in a way. So the audience is kind of surrounded by uh, all these monitors, these little squares there, and the, the um, actors would be in, in the center, uh, completely surrounded by televisions. Uh, well, the actors would be have televisions on each corner, but then the, there's the this ring of the audience, and then outside the audience there's a ring of television sets, and a lot of it also um, these designs are kind of made um, 
to give everybody a different point of view, no matter where they're sitting. Um, so this is uh, one corner of that piece called White Water, in which um, there's just this constant uh, array of images um, going, as well as um, three, no, actually four, four streams of video that are all edited to each other and to the live actors um, uh, speaking in a conversation together. Um, so I think I'm going to um, maybe show a videotape. OK, the other thing I should also talk about is the, lang the language. Um, I was very interested in, in film language, um, film type of acting as well. Um, was not interested in sort of a bombastic stage presence. I was much more interested in something that maybe would draw the audience in in a different way. Um, and uh, so typically, especially at that time, my, uh, my actress spoke very, very uh, quickly and in a very kind of a dry, flat, flat way. So um, I'm just going to play this little piece from uh, 2005 um, and uh, called Shatterham Massacre. Uh, I'm going to stop there, um, and then I'm going to just move on to a a different. Um, so that piece, just to, just to talk a little bit about. Um, sometimes I go on too much about f the form, but I think a lot of the content is actually in the form of what I'm doing as well, and that's one thing that I'm after is to somehow merge the content and the form together and have them really uh, work together. Um, so uh, that piece was uh, a lot of very fragmented uh, scenes. Um, it, uh, part of the content was about a, f a family uh, disintegrating and coming back together again. And actually, in, in the piece, uh, actually formally, it kind of disintegrated and then kind of came back together. Um, by my use of the arrangement of the scenes, the speed of the language, um, the use of the language, the words that sometimes might repeat themselves or repeat themselves in a different way further on down the line. So in that sense, um, sometimes I work with a, uh, a script in my mind really as if it is a film. Um, and there are pieces of, of film that um, can be uh, sometimes arranged or sometimes come out uh, pre-edited in, in my mind. 
Uh, so it's this whole idea of ar arranging and rearranging words and objects and images um, that is not particularly, let's say, uh, linear in a way at all. Um, okay, so here, this one is called uh, Black Maria, and um, it is actually five screens that are, five films that are playing at the same time. They've all been edited to each other. The audience sits in the center, and everything is rear projected, and there's a, a projection on the ceiling as well. Um, so these are some photos of, of that. And so the, these very large heads would be above the audience. The audience is down here. You can see their heads. Um, and there's this conversation going on, let's say, above the heads of, of the actors uh, who were inside this kind of a box of projections. Um, OK, so here, um, let me just get to this one. And if I could have a little bit of light. So um, just this picture here, I'm just going to show you. This is um, a piece called Everything That Rises Must Converge from 1990. Um, and we'll just say this is going to be a horrible drawing, not suitable for framing. So this is the, uh, let's say, the playing space. Um, there's half of the audience is over here, and half of the audience is over there. And then there's a wall in the middle of it that's about 10 feet high. You cannot see over it. Um, and there are about five actors on one side and five on the other side. Um, and then above this, there are, uh, actually, you can see over there better than I can draw them, but um, there are uh, monitors that face both ways. Um, and then there are cameras on the corner, each of the corners of the space, taking in whatever is on this side and sending it over to that side, and vice versa. And then there's a surveillance camera that goes over the wall and in a circular way, and you can see both sides of the wall, what's happening. Um, so uh, the audience is completely separated from each other, and the actors are separate from each other. Um, and they're basically having, it's, this was really, in a way, kind of a Cold War piece. It's kind of a love story. It's a Cold War story. Um, they're all speaking in a kind of a code language um, that, um, in some ways, you can't really uh, you can only partially understand by through the words, but um, it's the intent of the actors that the intent that they're showing is uh, really more how you can understand it. And I'll show you a little bit of a tape of this as well. So also there was a table that went right through, so sometimes people would have conversations with this wall between them. Um, then the other thing is that this wall slowly it was on a pivot, and slowly um, the actors uh, slowly started to move it, so that eventually it it was cut uh, this way, and so the audience could see all the way through. Um, and but this audience still could see only these actors, and this this audience could only see these actors. So the actors would move around with with this uh, wall, and then at one point the whole thing the actors pushed it and it spun. <coughs> around and then ended up in the reverse position. So uh, these people ended up with the actors on the other side of the wall and the other way around. So um, anyway, and the language is very, very fast. And I'll, I'll show you. This was kind of the, 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 in a way, kind of the high point of this very fast, um, almost kind of brutal um, language scenario that was, was happening. Uh, in my work at that time. So, um, all right, let me. This is the wall as it is, would be in its split way. So you see the table going all the way through, and you see the uh, television monitors above. And this is the wall from one side. One side of the wall was painted black, the other was painted white. Um, and then this is the wall as it was spinning. Um, and this is just another, this is side of the, the white side of the wall, the table through it. Um, OK, let's see if I can get this DVD happening again. So the way I explain this, this particular scene to people 
is it, it, this is about, in some ways, two governments um, spying on each other and fighting with each other and sending directives out, et cetera, with their staffs around them. One, one person is the leader of one country, the other one. And you'll be able to kind of see who was the, the a woman on one side, a man on the other side. Um, and it's kind of like a, really a meltdown in the Oval Room or something, simultaneous of two different Oval Rooms melting down together. Uh, the other thing is that I wrote it for both sides of the wall to uh, kind of have a conversation amongst each side and also have it be able to work for both sides together. So the lines are constantly going over, over the wall and um, circulating around. The other thing is that people, um, you'll see this edit is made up of all the pieces that were shot through the cameras that were uh, used on the video monitors. And um, the actors really, if they were talking to somebody on the other side of the wall, they would face a camera. Um, and not the audience, so. What is that stinking breeze I smell? There are a couple of boats all over the boat. The Navy is running in the harbor off of the storm. Couldn't they stick them to remove that stink and you know, this meat up smell all day? It gives me disgust the sun and the flies and the bodies cooking in their arms. We have soft and naked and back that sun itself and the bodies washed up. Change the direction of the wind. It's backward. Yes. 
preserved. And then you begin to talk about rat killing and bloodletting and killing, scourging. What is the meaning of this? What could be the reason? Okay, we're going to stop that there. Um, anyway, so uh, the other thing about this piece is that it, it did create uh, kind of a unique uh, uh, atmosphere because the both sets of actors were separated from each other uh, throughout the whole performance. They really only heard each other and saw each other on video. So um, that also created an interesting kind of uh, tension going on for them as well as, as the audience. Um, as well as all these other ways of, of, of speaking into cameras away from the audience, it's almost as if, um, in a way, the audience w wasn't even there. Um, and I'm sure that some of the audience felt like that too, but anyway. <laughs> um, all right, so I'm just going to go ahead a little bit more um, to a couple of other uh, Things I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip ahead to. Uh, well, I'll just I'll just pop in a couple of these. This was for one person and five cameras inside a very tiny room, um, and the audience actually never saw the person except on video. Uh, so it was this small room built on the stage, and these five videos that would actually change each time the the actor move. Uh, the images would change on the camera. Um, and this is actually the, uh, also the, the setup, which the audience would see, of these projectors. Uh, so OK, so I'm going to move to this one from 2000. It's called Snow. Um, and maybe I don't have to make a drawing for this. Can, anybody, can everybody see that? I don't know. Um, OK, so in this blue, the blue spot is where the audience is. Um, and they are completely isolated from uh, the actors. The actors are moving around in that light blue area. There's four rooms and four hallways. And uh, there are cameras, probably about 23 cameras uh, mounted everywhere to pick up the actors and then to project them inside to where uh, the audience is. And this is from the outside. Um, there was kind of a huge set. It was like a house, actually. Um, and uh, you can see the projections there. There's four projections, uh, one on each side. Um, then there was also a what, what I was calling a virtual actor. It was a computerized camera that was on a track and went all the way around. Um, you can see the track there. And it could follow an actor all the way around. So it was a point of view of one of the characters. You never actually saw the character. You only saw his point of view, and you heard his voice. So that was a program to, to follow the, the actors around. And this was a character that you, you actually never saw. You only saw what he saw. Um, and these are some of the hallways. And then this is the inside where the, the, um, the audience was and uh, and yes, yeah, so it was very much about isolating the audience um, uh, from the originators of actually of the content. Actually, were like a television show. Uh, the content is somewhere in LA or somewhere else. It's be being being beamed to us, and we're actually isolated from the live event. So this was a kind of a duplication of that, and it was also a. Uh, the plot kind of mirrored that. It was about a television studio. Um, so let me just, I'm going to show a couple of little clips from this. This is um, called uh, Snow. So we split it up into the four screens that the audience would actually see. This is the explanation of it, which, and this actually shows you a little bit what it's like to sort of be inside that space there.
50,000 times to come to the first level, then another million times to the next level, in a constantly revolving, arbitrary code. Gobbledygook. Kerfuffle after kerfuffle. Does Heather Lockley or know about this? What's the matter? I want you to do me a favor, Monty. Sure, what? Stay away from Vita. Why? What's wrong with me? Have I suddenly grown two heads? I just don't want you to take her out so much, that's all. <laughs> and it isn't funny. You're jealous. That's what it is, Mildred. She's just a kid. That's the point, Monty. She's only 17 years old and she's spoiled rotten. Well, don't blame that on me. I've worked long and hard, Monty, trying to give me to the things I never had. I've done without a lot of things, including happiness sometimes, because I wanted her to have everything. Now I'm losing her. She's drifting away from me. She hardly talks to me anymore except to poke fun at me in French because I work for a living. All oh, kids are thoughtless at her age. I don't like it and I blame it on the way she's been living. All right, all right. I won't take her out anymore. How's that? That's fine. But I'm warning you, Mildred. I don't think you know Vita very well. She's not like you. You'll never make a waitress out of her. You look down on me because I work. You always have. All right, I work. I cook food and sell it, and I make a profit on it, which I might point out you're not too proud to share with me. Yes, Mildred, I take money from you, but I flatter myself that I give value for value received. Monty, why can't you be different? We could get married, and you could manage the restaurants. No, thanks. I don't like kitchens or cooks. They smell of grease. It's not important. It's not? Not really. Get out of here, will you? Well, what are you doing with my files? What did I do wrong? Will you get out of here and let me work? I'm just trying to save my ass! Free your mind. Your ass will follow. <sighs> you are always a bizarre little child. Rasputina. Okay, action. Cricket, we're rolling. Cricket, are you okay? Cricket, say something. Cut. What is the matter with you? Cricket. Cricket? Can you hear me? What's the matter with her? She can't hear us. She doesn't know where she is. Cricket, wake up. Start rolling. Why? Why not? We've got to get something. How long do we have to finish this thing? Another week. We're behind schedule as it is. Just keep rolling. And okay, so um, I'll stop there. But uh, so a lot of these people would be acting, they'd be in completely separate rooms from each other. Um, the section with Mildred Pierce is that uh, this TV actress, this main actress, um, had to do several TV shows. So we did uh, you know, this scene from Mildred Pierce because they were making a, a remake of Mildred Pierce. So we kind of wove that into it as well. Um, but yeah, this was very interesting. There were, five, there were uh, four, four um, live actors and then this uh, virtual actor, which was that one scene with the woman looking into the camera. Uh, so they would be, f this, this camera would be following them around the set, actually, and they would be having to deal with it. Also, we used, uh, here you can see the actual tech room uh, where we were actually, all these things had to be edited live, and this was in 2000, which was a, kind of a very difficult thing to do. We had to have four separate editors editing these 23 cameras. Um, and so the, we also used that as a, uh, uh, a place to do scenes, but um, the, editing it live was actually perhaps the, um, just as hard as actually trying to act in a room by yourself with, with a camera, not knowing if the other person is actually in front of their camera. Um, so it did set up this really uh, interesting, uh, complicated uh, way of doing this piece every night, which was actually very live every night, but the audience experienced it live, but only only through uh, screens. Um, so, okay. I'm going to jump way ahead uh, here. Uh, these are, this is a bunch, this is Faust, um, and uh, which actually only had one camera. That's the other thing. I did, I'm, don't completely use a million cameras all the time. Sometimes if I can get away with using one good camera, then I'll use that. Um, and these are just, I'm just showing a bunch of different uh, variations of using um, uh, media and the set, and sometimes not so much media. But here's, this is um, uh, a piece I did, did with Neil Greenberg, Partial View, um, also in which we used a bunch of cameras which the dancers um, were able to move around in very specific situations, um, live 
and live cameras as well as pre-recorded mixed um, images. Um, any questions? So quiet out there. Is it, okay. Um, okay. So I'm going to I'm going to move to um, Firefall, which has actually started here in. I think it was 2006, actually. It was when we did the first version of it here with students. Um, and uh, then uh, later on, it went to Dance Theatre Workshop in uh, 2009, I think. So here, um, basically what it is, it's um, seven actors, and they're all hooked up to the internet um, live. And they're surfing. They have a script to attend to that they've, they, they've memorized. But they're all really allowed to interrupt the script whenever they want with any kind of live interruption from the internet. And so as we were rehearsing this and running it, um, I found the actors were getting kind of more and more daring. Some of them were shopping online while they were <laughs> doing. So all kinds of things are actually going on uh, while they're trying to stay on the script. And the thing about interrupting, constantly interrupting, or being able to interrupt each other with a, some piece from the, from the internet um, is that uh, it, it was kind of a deliberate uh, invitation of chaos into, into this piece. And so they would have to try to get back to the script where they, where they had left off. So it was a battle between uh, the use of memory, the use of um, the internet, um, their attention span. All these kinds of things were kind of working while they kept trying to get back to um, the script. Um, so I'm just going to show a little clip of that, which, where is it? OK, hold on for a minute. Um, which I think is kind of interesting. The other thing is that they, I also had them um, really uh, learn this script, in, and they spoke very, very quickly. Um, and then they would throw a wrench into everything by pulling up something on the internet. Also, they were free to use the cameras on their, um, on their, uh, cameras on their uh, computers um, and mediate themselves that way. So sometimes you'll see their face up there. And sometimes it'll be distorted. Um, there'll be all kinds of uh, interruptions. And the, the other thing is that the screen is, um, you'll see the part of what I was very interested in is this kind of a very active uh, screen, which also to me is kind of a, maybe um, a reflection of, of a mind. Um, just totally activated all the time, or wandering from here to there, and you actually never know what's going to uh, come up half the time. So um, yeah, this is just a little clip. There's, there's some interruptions, but also you'll see that uh, how active the screen is. It sort of reflects um, what each actor is doing. So each actor has, has one of those screens there. Um, so I'll just. Part of the regeneration. I think you should be removed. He's 
So we stop that there. Um, anyway, so that is just kind of an example of part of this with these uh, kind of interruptions that would really, you never knew what they were going to uh, bring up on the screen, which is, um, uh, for me as a director, was really kind of just completely, not completely, but letting go of my script in a way, throwing it to the, to the wolves, um, and then whatever, seeing what would come up. So many different kinds of things came up and including uh, one night some pornography came up and uh, uh, it just brought up a whole, whole other issue. Um, so, anyway. so yeah, it was, anyway, uh, so that is, that is a uh, firefall. Um, and I'm just wondering where, I'll just go back to the photos. Um, Questions? Any questions? Anybody? Oh, we're going to have a great question and answer session here. Um, anyway, this is uh, uh, two years, I guess, in 2011 or I can't remember, nine or 11. Um, this is really a, a use of uh, only probably three or four cameras. Um, this is Black Eyed Susan, um, who I work with a lot, um, playing. Uh, a, a kind of Queen Elizabeth the first kind of in a, uh, a kind of a version of it um, with a lot of different uh, projections but this is really just for two two people two live actors um, oh here is um, yeah just briefly this is um, also with Black Eyed Susan uh, uh, 2012 A Stop Bridge of Dreams which um, actually had uh, the audience was also split in two, and um, this side saw these screens, the other side saw the other side of the screen. Um, uh, a bunch of cameras also uh, uh, recording things, um, pre-recorded images as well, but a lot of different, let's say, geometric variations of the set with, between the light and the projections. <laughs> um, I'll just show you this, there's like a constant, um, moving puzzle of, of kind of visual pieces inside the space. Um, and I'll just show you a few clips of, of this as well, and then we can pretty much stop. But um, also the, the actors, you know, uh, from working my work, they they also have to learn to relate uh, to a camera uh, is usually there, not all the time, but so it is, um, the camera becomes a real part of it. It almost becomes, a, you know, a character in itself that it has to be dealt with and has its own demands um, on everything. Uh, this is, this is a, a uh, installation performance uh, from a few years ago, and this is these are just a few images from the recent Chang episodes that we did, just to show you kind of where it's uh, come to, at least visually. Um, and obviously, there's a lot more projections now. Um, I 
I was just thinking I would just show uh, a little piece of, um, well, either Chang or Stopbridge of Dreams. Contain things known as tales. <laughs> I was brought up in a part of the country so remote that it led me on the end of the Grady Strode. What an uncouth creature I must have been in those days. Yet even shut away in the provinces, I somehow came to hear that the world contained things known as tales. And from that moment, it was my greatest desire to read them for myself. To idle away the time, my sister, my stepmother, and others in the household would tell me stories from the tales, including episodes about Genji and the Shining Prince. But since they had to depend on their memories, they couldn't possibly tell me all I wanted to know, and their stories only left me more curious than ever. And, and now we must think of them only as images of themselves, which I beg you to erase from your mind. Otherwise, you will suffer the pain of loss. I will continue to suffer this, as I can never release their images from my thoughts. I am much too far into the age of nothing to do anything but use my memory. So, I will recite from memory. Supposedly, this takes place in the pleasure quarters of a large 17th century Japanese city. My middle-aged mother apparently owns a tea house in which... Her son has been employed his whole life. We both are under the belief that one of us has died. We spend our time wondering who will mourn the other. Neither dares take the plunge and give in to become the mourned. Yeah, well, someone is dead in this scene and it's not me. <laughs> We're not someone. We're not even anyone. We're not anything. We are made up. We're only pictures on a scroll. We're not even born yet. Why do you all got the cow eye? Scared me. I wait and wait and wait for that goddamn Englishman spirit to come for a drink. It'll come back. I gotta move on. You know, like American folk song. You gotta move. We cannot land in Bangkok. The official I usually pay off died suddenly this morning. They found out who's on the plane and won't let us land. We have to get them off the plane. We've tried to get to another airport, but they have been tipped off. So we'll have to stay up here till we can work out a deal. He's wanted in The Hague. And I just spent all night with him. Why didn't you tell me? Call the U.S. Embassy. I tried to rebook with this one guy, he said. Don't leave me Tangere. Says there a son. Touch me not, I am Caesar. I never saw him again. Spy. I think he must be dead by now, one way or another. I see him in the world of dust outside the windows. He must be dead. He seemed like he was in a descent. He didn't want to take me with him. I would have gone. Where is this coming from? We are haunted. You. And me, everyone on this plane, including that little dog. We are a form of a haunt, circling and circling and circling the world, tying it all up in twisted ribbons. It's a strange gift. <laughs> This monk barbecued himself up here one night at 30,000 feet. They usually never make any trouble. At first I thought he was freebasing. It almost brought us down. We couldn't save him. We held a mask for him and dropped him into the South Pacific. Luckily it was his poor time to roll, for God's sake, and dance. Okay, so we'll, we'll stop there. Maybe we can take uh, questions now. So. Um, I was wondering if you made use of dated media, uh, like now if you were using VHS tapes, if you ever implemented that in your work? Uh, using, I'm sorry, what? Uh, dated media. Meaning? Instead of, instead of keeping up with the time, like using, you know, the television that was part of your history and then using the internet. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, sometimes uh, TVs Retro. have shown up. Uh, you know, once you use, once you are, have been forced to use that for so many years, <laughs> you really don't want to go back, uh, in a way. I mean, all the things that have happened were all things that I was 
dreaming of, you know, someday I won't have to use this huge television set. You know, the, the tape deck was huge in the 80s. And so you want to get lighter and to get more towards your ideas rather than sticking with, in some ways, it turns out to be like a piece of furniture. Uh, so um, I th think that's probably, you know, would be probably more interesting dealt with by younger people. They they would see those things in a different way than I would. You know, I'm sort of like, oh my god, I you know, what do I have to do with that anymore? Uh, but yeah, I, I think people should 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 uh, definitely. I mean, people have ma made a lot of interesting things. I see people that you know, they make stuff with cassettes now and all this kind of uh, stuff. But yeah, I, I you know. I don't, I don't, you know, I, I have enough of those tapes sitting around in my, my house. I don't want to, you know, uh, deal with them. So, but, Thank you. all right. Hello. Um, I just have a question about oh. Firewall. So oh, Firefall. Firefall. Well, Firewall too, yeah. <laughs> okay. I was wondering if um, you found it difficult, because it seemed to have a lot of different images. Mm -hmm. um, if you found it difficult at any point, to keep the attention of the audience on the text as opposed mm. to everything that was going on the yeah. screen? Yeah, well, that's a good question. I mean, that in a way was a deliberate um, wrench I threw into everything. It was, you know, a lot of these things are in some way me kind of daring myself to do something because I want to see what's going to happen or what would it be like if this was set up like that. So in a way, that was, um, let's say, kind of an extreme example of that. But I wanted to see what would happen. I wanted to also be able to let go of the, the script in a way and see how, how it fared and also see how the actors would, would um, either cling to it or reject it or see what kind of ownership they started taking of it, um, where actually, eventually, unless they want to improvise the rest of the show, but that they, they um, kind of reinvested themselves in the script uh, okay. because they had to leave it. So they, had to, they wanted kind of to come back to it in a way. And the script uh, was kind of deliberately full of all kinds of images and stuff, but it did uh, kind of have a through line. Um, and uh, they all kind of had different names. I think most of them had names. And they, they all sort of had a directive uh, in a way. Um, but yeah, it was a way of really kind of pushing myself um, slightly off a cliff <laughs> because I would have to sit there and say, oh my god, the, you know, my script is like now out of the picture. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it seems to me uh, that the images were not as important but almost as important as the text from the piece we saw. Um, and it was part of the text. In some way, well, it was a competition between the two. I mean, they were kind of competing with each other and trying to, and of course the audience would sometimes see the images and just because of the way everybody's trained, they would figure, oh, somebody's talking about, I don't know, Jesus or something and they're kind of trying to find Jesus on the screen somewhere or vice versa, they'll see a tiger or something and they go, why, why did that <laughs> happen then? So it was really like a f kind of a strange mixing of um, images and words that actually never had anything to do with each other. Um, and then forcing that into, let's say, an hour and 10 minutes or something and uh, seeing. But then, I mean, that's kind of like real life. You walk down the street or you watch something uh, in a movie or whatever. You're, just, you're getting all this stuff is passing through your head. It's kind of, this is a reflection of that. Yeah. Um, and you kind of have to put all these things together. Um, so, thank you. Yeah. Hi, um, I was wondering about like what is your process in terms of making decisions about where to place things on stage and, mm -hmm. and what angles to like shoot things from or like or like um, how you set up. Us? Okay, yeah, that's that's also a good question because when I'm writing, I'm also uh, designing the set in a way. And I'm also thinking about what images I'm going to use. So I'm kind of balancing all that together. But then when, once I get to the space, that's when you know, I know what's going to happen is that reality is going to set in. And you realize you can't put the camera where you wanted it to be, because either the camera 
doesn't like where it is or there's not enough space for. So it's um, adapting yourself with a certain percentage of what you want and then um, also welcoming what the challenge you're going to have. How am I going to get around, you know, where are we going to put this camera or how are we going to do this projector? And that actually spawns um, creativity and, and helps uh, other things happen. And you kind of learn and you kind of expand your, your idea. Um, so it's a mixture of both those things. And I, I, and I do um, like sort of the challenge of now what are we going to do with this? Shall we throw it out? Shall we keep it in? So there's part of that live thing. And then there's the, the feeling of, yes, I have it all planned like this. This is the way it's going to go. And I think formerly I was more um, attached to that. Now I'm, uh, I always would leave like, I always knew there was maybe 20 or 30% of, you know, of wiggle room where we're going to have to, something's going to have to be reconfigured, uh, which I always like. But now I'm, I, you know, I, I like even in this, this firefall, I just thought, well, you know, let's, it's going to have to be maybe 50% <laughs> where I'm going to have to deal with it. So, um, it's trying to be open to all these things and not just insisting on your idea. Because you realize, actually, your, your idea is subject to reality. It's subject to a lot of other things. You just, um, your perfect thing can, be, can happen only sometimes. And that's not such a bad thing, so. So, wait, so, does, your, so does your script inform how you want it oh. to? Well, yeah, the script, this, actually the script a lot of times, let's say, even with the actors and everything, you know, it's all, it's like a map. It's, a lot of it is, is in the script. Okay. Um, but, you know, the script can be changed uh, or altered. I can move scenes around if I want. Uh, like I said, formally, I used to be much more, um, it used to be much more fixed. Now I'm kind of much more fluid about it. So, but the script actually has a lot of, um, uh, a lot of the actors I work with, just they, they get the script and, and they, the more they read it, we just keep reading it over and over again and then they fall into um, certain kinds of uh, patterns with each other and with the language. And it still remains kind of a really interesting kind of map to discover things, I think, as, as an actor, and, uh, for me too, because I'm also waiting to hear it back, and there's a lot of things that I learn once I hear them actually say it, which I, I need them to do that. Um, so it all kind of comes to life with that. But the script does, does um, it doesn't, the other thing though, that the one thing that it doesn't do is if, if, if uh, you know, let's say somebody's talking about um, a car or a dog or something like that, um, the question I don't want to hear from the actor is, oh, well, where's the dog? Or where's the car? Mm -hmm. They said you, you, they said that we're, we're in a car, <laughs> and um, I I am not uh, attached to uh, those things. In my scripts, don't actually only mean that. Um, all you have to do is actually suggest that you're in, or say you're in a car, and you're in a car. You don't have to have a car on stage, or a, um, so things like that. Or if somebody even like in the last Chang, somebody. They were talking about guillotines, and somebody said, um, oh, my neck hurts. I mean, that was the character said that. Um, but the actress wanted to go, oh, my neck hurts like that. And I said, you don't have to, all you have to just say is your neck hurts. You don't have to show your neck. You have to advertise it. And you have to announce it. You know, it's, you know, just by saying it, you've done so much already. So anyway. Yeah. Hi, um, I have a question about um, when um, productions, when you're using pre-recorded projections mm -hmm. and you're playing them simultaneously, yeah. um, how exactly do you uh, synchronize them to do that, to run simultaneously? Um, as much as possible. I, I hate to go back into the old days, but you know, in the old days, it was really, you're just basically trying to hit the buttons at the same time from this clunky old thing and hope that it was, the gear was going to catch into it and go right. So yeah, it's, it, it, as much as possible, 
Um, although really interesting things would happen, like sometimes there, you know, the film might, might be like a couple of frames behind and start lagging. And so that also then creates an interesting thing for the actor to try to manage that and uh, uh, figure out how to make it appear to be working. And um, so all those kinds of things are not, they can be a disaster if they don't work exactly well, but they also, it opens up a whole new world of um, what's happening. Like once in the, the one with the film, um, the, the, uh, the sound went out on the, on the film. And so um, the actors just really, by their wits, they just um, kept their side of the conversation going. And then the, you know, the, the screen would answer with, with silence. The mouths would be moving. And they'd read the lips. And so it was a, a really interesting sort of exercise in sort of interpretation and, and kind of balancing their voice with the silence, which apparently was supposed to have a voice in it. And uh, so it was really kind of interesting. It was really interesting when the voice came back in uh, on the screen. So um, anyway, all those things are, are always create more more interesting things than they do uh, disaster, I think, so. Have you found that the uh, synchronization process has improved over time with technology? Um, yeah, actually, it, it has, actually. It's much, much uh, smoother. And, well, you have to have the right technician. So, but yeah, it is, yeah. Do you work a lot with technicians and collaborate with them specifically? Do you um, well, I, yeah, I work a lot with technicians, and I like to, you know, a lot of it is um, me asking them, can you do this, can you do that, can you do that, why can't we do this, uh, when are we able to do it, uh, why, you know, and then, then they try and figure something out, uh, or they, they'll say, well, I can't do this, but I can do that. So um, that's kind of a lot of the, the way that I, I, I work on it, and then, um, as time has gone on, especially lately, I'm, I'm more willing to, once the technician really knows kind of the way I work and what I want, I just let them um, uh, suggest things or, or try to, to handle it. If I really trust them, then I'm okay with that, whereas formally I would just have to control everything. So um, it's a different way of kind of getting what you want. So more relaxed, so. Um. Um, do you believe that media is separ it separates us from one another? Because it seems like a pattern throughout your work that either the, the actors are separate from one another or mm. the audience is separated, right. or, I mean, it just seems like separation right. is there. But, but media is separation. <laughs> it, I mean, that, that's what it is. Um, even a painting or a drawing is a separate uh, thing has been created separately from you and then you look at it as a separate thing and then something in a more um, interior mind space or something is how you maybe can approach it and kind of commune with it and, and not be separate from it. But, you know, media, especially the modern media, is actually, that's why it was created because, um, uh, well, maybe not, not to separate, but to uh, connect. But in doing so, it, it, it ends up, by its nature, has to come from separate, separate things. So I, I mean, I, in, it, it, it does and it, it doesn't. That's always been kind of the, the issue with it. And I think it's kind of a, a continuing argument that will never be solved, and that's, that's inherent in it. It will never be, it's always going to do both things. And then that's how human beings get either screwed up by it or they are able to use it. And um, uh, because working with all these things for so many years, you know, it's very, can be very frustrating. And you realize, yes, it's a machine, it's actually not a human being. And then sometimes it's, you think, oh, this is great. Uh, the machine is just being much more cooperative than a human being. And then other times it's just, not, and you wish it was a human being. So, um, and all that kind of comes up, you know, when I'm working with actors and stuff like that. Those kind of issues uh, come up, you know, in people's minds, and that, that a lot of that is uh, kind of about that. 
So. Hello again. Um, I just have a question. Hmm. Um, are you, when you come up with your script, are you first inspired by an idea of a set and then you sort of create a story around it or is it the other way around? Um, sometimes they come together um, and um, and really the, in a way that the ideas are kind of fluid meaning like writing is not just writing it's somehow connected to drawing for me or envisioning something. So they're part of each other. They're not kind of on, in separate departments. So writing or acting or movement, you know, I, I sort of, all these things kind of uh, arrive, you know, together in a lot of times. So they're not, I don't say, I just have a, a, a drawing that is completely separate from, maybe sometimes, but generally I don't have a drawing or a piece of writing that's completely separate from everything else. It's usually somehow connected to something else, or I know it will be. Um, it's looking for a connection. So I, yeah, I really just believe in this kind of fluid uh, movement between all these kinds of things and not trying to sort of imprison each one in, in its own corner and make which sometimes happens in theater, you know, the writer is the enemy of the director and the actor is the enemy of the something else and the set is the enemy of the... <laughs> um, and uh, so I kind of see them all together, so. Um, in the piece with the projections, all the projections on the screen, mm -hmm. Would you say that it was more of a test of the actor's ability to memorize the script and their attention span, or is it more of a test of the audience? Um, in some ways, it was a, t a test of the audience, because the audience really was kind of distracted. Uh, but, you know, it was a, it was a, it's a presentation. It's, you know, I prefer not to really think of it as a test, even though the actors were, let's say, tested in some way. Um, but um, because they were actors or performers, you know, that was, that is their interest. That's what they kind of wanted to be there to do. They wanted to be able to, to see if they could uh, do this. So, um, so, yeah, I don't know if it's so much of a, a test, even though it is, um, it is a, str there's struggle is involved. So, but I, but I uh, kind of invite that into my work. I, you know, we have to kind of show the struggle or be part of a struggle to, to have something. And that's not, struggle is not a bad thing. And so if the audience has a struggle too, then well, we're all struggling to, together. I mean, that's the other thing that with the audience, maybe they, they're struggling to understand something, but they're going, oh yeah, well, I'm struggling, but that actor is, you know, uh, struggling um, not, not in a suffering way but they you know they're they're really uh, working and I can see them working so I I like to see that on a on a stage not just sort of a representation of some fabulous character or something like that um, I want to see into who the performer is too so thank you uh, anybody else Oh, Bonnie? I just have one quick question. Since many of us saw Chang, maybe you oh. can talk a little bit more about, about uh, Chang and Void Moon, since many of us oh. saw that. OK. Um, yeah, Chang. OK. So um, well, because it started you know, so long ago, and it really was um, this kind of feat of endurance for, for everybody. Everybody kind of agreed. They, they would do this thing and then we just, the rest of it was trying to figure out how to do it. So first of all, in many ways, it is, it is a, uh, this um, very uh, challenging, it's a challenge. Uh, and because it goes week to week, if you're doing it several weeks in a row and you're in several of these episodes, um, 
the pressure starts coming um, not only from uh, the previous episode, but from the next one and the one after that. So it's a lot of, um, uh, it's not just like doing a play. It's uh, doing something that it has to be done in one, uh, one, less than one week. It has to be memorized. It all has to be put together. And so everybody um, is part, part of that. And um, so that's how that, that works. It's a, it's a kind of a different atmosphere than just putting on a, um, a play, like rehearsing for six or eight or 10 weeks or something like that. Um, it's, it has very much to do with being immediate and uh, of the moment. And some performers and people can't, cannot handle that at all, which is fine, I understand. But, and then there are other ones that just really kind of thrive on it. And um, so when we originally did it, I mean, that's really where everybody learned how to do, I learned how to write, I mean, it was just, the pressure was on to produce something. And so the actors had to learn how to act, and it was amazing how quickly people uh, develop uh, when they're given a, a challenge, if they're, if they're up to it. So um, I don't know what else, can we, any other thoughts on that or questions you have? Well, you, know, you have 62 episodes no. now, so what about right. now when it's not in a club scene every night? Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, more in the worst. This was worse. I mean, in a way, because uh, we did it only every. We did two shows every Monday night, um, and this we were doing. We had three three nights, which means that we had less time to to rehearse. So if you're doing one show, you know you can start kind of working the next day. So I had less time to write it. The actors had less time. We had uh, three days less than we did at the Pyramid Club, and no free drinks. <laughs> so. <laughs> So it was a, di a different, um, it was harder in, in some ways. Uh, so yeah, it was, it was a diff it's a, a different uh, thing. But still, the, all that kind of uh, pressure is, um, is there. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you.